In today's presentation, we're going to look at a couple of dot points. The first is discuss examples of variation between members of a species. And the second, identify the relationship between variation within a species and the chance of survival of the species when environmental change occurs. Okay, before we get going, we need to define some terminology. So we'll spend a little bit of time defining terminology. The first word is variation. So variation is defined as differences in characteristics of individuals within a population. And further to that, we need to look at that word population. So population is a word that you would have learned earlier on this year in a local ecosystem. So the idea of population is that a group of organisms of the same species that live in the same area. Uh, so uh, it may be a group of uh, sulfur crested cockatoos that live around the school. That would be a population. Uh, the second idea is this concept of characteristics. Okay, so differences in characteristics. So what do we mean by that? So characteristics can mean a number of things, but they can mean appearance. So whether they have uh, fur, scales, the colour of the fur, uh, feathers, uh, and any uh, number of other physical features that you can uh, identify or make observations about. The second is function. So we're thinking of uh, adaptations, and function would be this idea of uh, adaptation, so uh, physiological adaptation. So function would be endothermy or ectothermy. Um, it could also be whether they lay eggs, uh, whether they internal fertilization or external fertilization. And finally, the other characteristic that we'll be looking at is uh, genetic makeup. So genetic makeup. So the genes that make up the organism. Next one we need to define is the word species. Uh, species, if we think about from the previous topic, is uh, the lowest level in the linear uh, system of classification. Okay, in this term, species is a popula population of organisms with similar appearance that can actually or potentially interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So what's important here is that they can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Okay, so not only do they have similar appearances, but they can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So this differentiates from organisms that can interbreed but uh, do not produce fertile offspring. In the case of a, a horse and, and a donkey producing a, a mule, uh, they are, the mule are infertile, so therefore uh, they are not related on the species level, but more likely to be related on the genus level. We can see in this uh, this slide we've got a, a number of examples of uh, dog species. So from our Doberman to a Golden Retriever to uh, an Australian Terrier. Okay, so the important thing to notice here is that they're all, it's a variation in a species, and this species is Canis lupus or dog. So all these dogs potentially can interbreed, and they have all been developed uh, due to human demand over, over centuries from... Uh, from uh, more ancient uh, species of dog, most probably closely related to something like the dingo. So Canis lupus, uh, it's actually called the subspecies familiaris, whereas uh, the dingo would be Canis lupus, uh, and the subspecies would be dingo. There are a number of different types of uh, species within the genus of Canis. Um, however, all the ones that we understand of, our, our golden retrievers, our Dobermans, and many, many, many more, are all just uh, breeds of the same species because they can all interbreed to produce fertile offspring. This is also the same for you know, species of cats, breeds of cats. Uh, they all come from the same group, which was uh, Felis catus. Felis catus. So all those breeds that we, we would know of in Australia are all come from the same group. Just fearless catters. And again, with horses, horses all come, uh, except for wild, and we need to distinguish wild horses from uh, feral horses at the Brumby in Australia and uh, the uh, American equivalent of the, the, the Brumby. Uh, but all horses come from the Equus ferus group. So they're all 
able to interbreed. The difference being that uh, horses used the what they call thoroughbreds for racing uh, have been developed uh, from very very stringent bloodlines over a number of uh, another number of centuries. However, potentially can be interbred with uh, with brumbies in Australia. A specifically Australian example of the variation of species is in the magpie. If we look at the uh, diagram, the map of Australia, we can see that there, around Australia there are slight variations in the feather colour of the magpies. So previously, you know, time of European settlement, they thought they were different species. However, they, they now, through science, understand a lot better that this is more just variation. And as these variations are kind of centralised, one around Sydney and New South Wales as a blackback, uh, the one in... Uh, you can see down the bottom here, this guy here, with the white back, and we have kind of a greyish back over in Perth, the grey back. What we do see on uh, kind of these zones of where there's crossing over is that we, we get a variation in colour. So they're all the same species, however there is some variation in colour. Uh, why this variation occur will be uh, spoken of in the next part. Another Australian example is the budrigar. We can see on the left hand side, the budrigar here is the green version. Okay, so this uh, green version is the wild type. Exists in the wild in Australia. So we can see this guy here. Uh, so, however, due to selective breeding and captivity, there's been a vast array of colours being developed. And we can see just a portion of the different colours developed from our canary yellows, so the budrigar, to whites, um, blue, it's what they call pied, where there are variations in colour, all the way to um, pink and red. They do have even feather variations, where the feathers cover their eye and they're long and, and uh, uh, yeah, long and whispery kind of feathers as well. So we can see that sele through selective breeding, we can bring out variations that exist in the gene pool of the, the budrigar that not necessarily uh, exist in the wild because obviously in the wild being green in green trees is a massive advantage they won't get uh, preyed upon by uh, hawks if they're green as easy as if they're another color where they can easily be seen so we can see that through uh, human selective breeding we can bring out some of the, the traits that exist or some of these variations that exist in the budgerigar that not necessarily are seen due due basically to being uh, preyed upon. Finally, the, there is also variation that exists between male and females within the, the population. Uh, so some of this is, is obviously observable and we can see that uh, observable um, variation and what we call that is dimorphic. So the word dimorphic means that the variation is observable. Okay, we can see this even in the budgerigar here, that the um, nasal area is a different colour in the male compared to a female. Uh, the male birds sometimes are more brightly coloured than the female, sometimes they're larger. And in different species of animals, we can see the same thing occurring. So it's important to uh, discuss and differentiate variation of species due to environment heredity. Environmental variation is not uh, due to any genetic difference, but is influenced by the access to uh, nutrition. If we look at children in Africa compared to children in the Western world, we can see the effects of nutrition. Uh, skinny limbs, uh, pot belly due to lack of food, and if they to survive, sometimes they, you know, they're, they're skinnier and don't reach their full, full height. Uh, that is compared to people in the Western world who have more access to food. Uh, competition for resources and competing organisms within an environment where one organism will eventually win, the other organism will, will not be able to uh, survive. And abiotic factors. So abiotic factors are important as well. So we think of abiotic factors were availability to water, availability to sunshine, especially in plants, sunshine, and, and getting above the, uh, the canopy to reach sunshine is also a very important factor. If we look at the idea of heredity, uh, so where variation is due to heredity, it can be passed onto, uh, onto the offspring from the parents. It is this type of variation that is linked to genetics and is um, originally introduced into a population due to mutation. So there's a genetic link and it all has to do with mutations that occur 
and these mutations that occur from time to time can be carried on from parent to offspring, parent to offspring. So also important to think there that not all mutation is bad. So not all mutation is bad. It's actually essential for variation to occur. Last thing to say about uh, hereditary is that it's a uh, is essential in the study of evolution relationships of all organisms. Without this understanding of how organisms are related, we have less of an understanding about where we come from as well. Final point to make is that uh, sometimes there is a combination of genetic and environmental causes that uh, cause variation in an organism, such in, in the Arctic fox and other Arctic animals. So we can see the Arctic fox, fox at the top, uh, in opposite the summer months, its, it's fur is, is dark green patches, and uh, even the white isn't as white. And then we can see the fur in, in the winter, in the lower picture, um, that uh, is, is, is much whiter. So the, the, the colour of the fur is, is a genetic link. However, it is the actual cold, so it's the cold or the extreme cold, extreme cold, that brings about this changing uh, in, in fur colour. So we can see that both environment and genetics play a part in, uh, in the fur colour in the Arctic fox. Next section we're going to look at is variation survival of population when environmental change occurs. Environmental change. So what is or leads to environmental change? These things can include the temperature, where an environment gets hotter or colder. Okay, so over a sustained period of time. Uh, the other thing is water availability. Water availability. So water availability, uh, whether a continent is drying out, as in development of a, the Australian continent, as it dried out, the water availability was less could also be that water availability increases or there are periodic droughts followed by periodic um, wet seasons. That's going to cause environmental change as well. Next thing will be competition for resources. So this is not the normal competition for resources but say there's loss of habitat or introduction of a species that uh, requires the same resources as a species already there. Where one organism will win and the other organism may not win. And often it's the introduced species because they have no natural predators. Disease is also an example of environmental change. And finally, predation from introduced species. Uh, so some of those introduced species into Australia might be uh, cats, foxes, uh, dogs, to, uh, to name a few. I'm going to look at specifically uh, how variation causes environmental change. So must, it's very important to note that variation exists amongst members of the same species and we've been looking at that through examples of the dog, budgerigar, uh, and even uh, even humans, variation exists. Uh, so variation, variation exists amongst members of the same species. That always occurs uh, first. Uh, point two is that sudden change in the environment. So sudden change in the environment. Individuals with variations that possess an advantage are more likely to survive the changed conditions. Those who do not have this variation are less likely to compete or survive. Okay, so it's not necessarily that they'll die straight away, they just might not be able to successfully breed, which um, it still has the same detrimental effect over time. Third point, those individuals that uh, survive pass on their characteristic to offspring, so reproduction. Over time, less favourable characteristics will be removed from the gene pool. Now this is also important that just because uh, individuals have a characteristic survive, they're not necessarily going to pass just that on. There is still some variation that will pop up from time to time. And if the environment was to change again, it's important that variation still exists. However, over time, less favorable characteristics are removed. 
And finally, uh, over time, the favourable variations, which we, we now call adaptations, become more dominant within the population. So it's important, as I said to start with, that the variation exists way before the environmental change occurs and that these are selected over the variations that are not as favourable. So where all these ideas about variation fit in is uh, really comes down to the crux of uh, what Charles Darwin and Edward Wallace uh, had proposed, so that evolution occurs by this idea of natural selection. And they both came up with this idea independently of each other. Uh, Charles Darwin had travelled around the world um, to Australia and most famously to the Galapagos Islands where he had observed the beaks of finches and a number of other organisms. Uh, Alfred Wallace had travelled a fair bit around Southeast Asia and, and uh, noticed a change in organisms through Southeast Asia, which is now called the Wallace Line. Interesting, the Wallace Line is also sits along the, the tectonic plates, so there's a change in organisms that are coming from the Australian plate and uh, the, the plate uh, that Australia collided with some millions of years ago. So in 1858, they're both accredited to this, and Charles Darwin famously wrote a book, which was uh, Natural Selection, uh, by means of, sorry, evolution by means of natural selection. So they pointed out these ideas that variation must exist, just as we looked at before, variation must exist. So individuals, individuals that reproduce sexually show variation. Next point they made was that there are selective pressures. What they mean by selective pressures is that changes uh, in the environment that put constraints on organisms to determine which individuals are best suited to the change conditions. So the selective pressure might be uh, availability to water. Availability to water. So organisms that are able to conserve water, say plants that can conserve water, uh, the less water is lost through evaporative cooling, are going to survive over plants that have more uh, high water demand. This leads to the third point, survival of the fittest. Now survival of the fittest is, always comes with this idea that more org organisms are reproduced than can possibly survive to reproduce themselves. So individuals that outcompete those with less favourable conditions will pass on genetic information. So individuals that outcompete can pass on uh, the changed conditions or their changed variations. Uh, survival of the fittest, it's important to say that it's not just the strongest. In Australian history, if we look at the, the death of the megafauna, which we're going to down the, down the track, uh, the megafauna were bigger than a lot of the, the current species we know, but their energy demands were much, much higher than a, a drying uh, Australian continent could afford so they became extinct over time. So the survival of the fittest is, again, what is best suited for the environment. Now the final point to make is isolation. So isolation prevents inbreeding. So why is this important, prevention of inbreeding? We prevent inbreeding long enough, uh, evolution will occur, species uh, will have show variation that's much different and uh, lead to them not being able to reproduce with, with organisms they once could. So two species are isolated on two different islands and are separated for long, long periods of time and they are no longer either it's due to uh, things, uh, functional things, so the way they behave, uh, or whether it's due to structural things, they're no longer able to reproduce. So this prevents inbreeding. And it leads to this idea of what we call speciation. Speciation, the development of a new species because of all these factors. There's variation, there's selective pressures, a change in the environment. Survival of the fittest, where the most suited organism to the environment occurs. So most suited organism survives and, and the ones that are less suited do not survive. And then finally this idea of isolation. So isolation of two spe uh, two groups of, uh, of, of a species of organisms 
and over time those variations lead to the development of new species.